Hello, and welcome to Unit 3. This is the first of the actual topical monthly units that we're going to be doing here on the Discussions in Science and Religion uh, Facebook group. Um, the plan here uh, is to have a different topic every month, uh, and we're going to be having uh, somebody, uh, or hopefully two, three, maybe even four people at the beginning of each month give some introductory presentations um, from various points of view on a given topic, uh, and then let those uh, very brief presentations uh, be the spark for the discussions that we're going to have for the rest of the month. Um, the whole point of this group is to uh, expose everybody, no matter where you're coming from, no matter what kind of background you've got in science and or religion, uh, to expose you to some new ideas, uh, to find a place where, to be a place where everybody can open their minds up a little bit, maybe learn something new, maybe uh, question some beliefs that you've had, uh, coming into things, or just, uh, you know, enrich your perspective by hearing uh, things from other points of view. Um, I'm very excited about the whole thing, and I think it's going to be great. I'm, I think we're off to a good start. Uh, so this month, as our introductory thing, uh, we're going to be uh, talking about just some of the historical ways in which the two concepts of science and religion have been viewed um, interacting with each other, just some really broad strokes. Uh, we're not even going to try and define science and religion yet. I think we're going to hold that off for a little bit because that can get kind of tricky. Um, and as a framework, uh, what I've decided to do is to um, show some concepts that were first delineated by uh, the guy who's kind of the founder of the modern, um, at least academic, work between um, science and religion. And his uh, is a guy by the name of Ian Barber. Uh, so Ian Barber, uh, he, here he is, 1923 to 2013, PhD in physics from the University of Chicago and a Bachelor's of Divinity from Yale. Uh, pretty awesome to be able to do both of those things, I sympathize. Um, taught at Carleton College in Minnesota for, for like you know, decades and decades. Super, super cool guy. Um, credited with the idea of, um, he's at least one of the, the first guys who, who talked about the idea of critical realism. Uh, he might have even coined the term, not entirely sure about that. So critical realism being the idea that there there is a real world out there. At least there's no reason for us to not say that there isn't one. Um, but we have to be critical about how we how we approach it and see um, what's really going on, because senses can be confused, for sure. Um, but in he has published a, a number of books uh, very uh, broadly about how science and religion go together. Um, and he's, in a couple different places, put forth the following four models that we're going to be looking at today. So the four models, the four ways in which science and religion interact with each other, according to, to Barber, are conflict, independence, dialogue, and integration. We're going to take a second to look at each one of these individually. So conflict is the one that has uh, certainly gotten the most press, uh, especially recently, but over you know the last couple of centuries for sure. Um, ever since modern science had its, uh, you know, its birth in the in the the Enlightenment, um, it has definitely created some conflict <laughs> between uh, worldviews as people are trying to understand. You know, does uh, does some of these these things that we're learning with with new science does it uh, contradict the theological beliefs that we've had? Our, our understanding of who God is, of what the world is, of humanity's place within the world. Um, you can see how that that has <laughs> certainly been a big thing all the way back to uh, the Galileo trial, which hopefully in some future month we're going to spend some time specifically talking about that, because it's a lot more complicated than you might think just off the surface. Um, but as Galileo you know, first said, maybe the Earth's not the center of the universe, and everybody's like, what the heck? Um, and that created all sorts of theological problems, because it, it seems, if you take certain verses in the Bible, that, the, um, that it says that you know, the earth is the center of things and that the sun goes around the earth. Um, now we know that not to be the case, but that certainly created a lot of dissonance within people's minds at the time, and it took a long time to work through that for a lot of people. Um, more recently, a um, famous case here in America would be the Scopes trial, which is where a uh, high school biology teacher wanted to teach, uh, you know, Darwin's concept of evolution in a public school, and um, there was a giant trial about that. Uh, that's a you know, uh, an issue that has uh, continued to, to go to date. I mean, just even a couple years ago, right down the road from where I live in Dover, Pennsylvania, we had a court hearing about um, teaching intelligent design in schools, and we're going to definitely have some of that as a, as a topic as we move forward. But the idea that, so the, the conflict idea here, you can have you can have people on both sides of this issue um, believe in, in the conflict model between science and religion. You can have people who are total materialists 
um, atheists, if you will, in, in some respects, um, that think there's absolutely no way that there could be anything outside of the material universe, that there's that all of this theological gobbledygook, as they would say, it doesn't have anything to do with reality, and people are just making that stuff up. Um, and so science and religion are in conflict in that point of view. But then on the other side of thing, you also have uh, certain types of fundamentalists, and this can go for any religion, not just conservative Christianity, um, but uh, fundamentalists who say that their, their holy texts are the way that it is, and if anything in science seems to contradict uh, what you believe uh, your holy text is teaching you, then the science is wrong, um, and they you know, bury their head in their sand and, and not want to look around. Um, these are kind of extreme views, but you can see how uh, you know there there are things that are out there. Real people believe both of these things. Maybe you are on you know close to one side of those that spectrum or another. Moving on, we're going to look at the idea of independence, um, and this is the idea that science and religion are both valid, but that they have nothing to do with each other. That they're talking about two completely different things. Um, for example, the National Academy of Science uh, has this very famous statement from 1984. They said, um, religion and science are separate and mutually exclusive realms of human thought, whose presentation in the same context leads to misunderstanding of both scientific theory and religious belief. Uh, or maybe you guys have heard of this guy, Stephen Jay Gould, um, famous uh, evolutionary biologist, uh, who put forth the idea of non-overlapping magisterium, as he called it. So science has its realm of authority where it can talk about what goes on in the physical world, um, and we can make very clear uh, measurements about what we see and what we're studying. Uh, but on the other side, uh, religion is totally responsible for anything um, metaphysical, and the two don't have anything to do with each other. Um, scientists shouldn't comment on whether or not God exists because there's no scientific evidence one way or the other. And likewise, uh, religious believers as such um, shouldn't say what's true or what's not about science, but you should follow the evidence. And those two fields don't have anything to do each with each other. Um, so that's the independence model. Model number three is dialogue. So dialogue is the idea that rather than looking just from the point of view of science or from the point of view of religion, uh, you look at both of them together and you see how they can view the world uh, in the same ways. Like you have the ideas of um, some of the hot topics lately are, you know, emergence or uh, information theory and those kind of things can, there are things that both science and religion can say and can learn from each other um, as they work together to try and understand the topic. And then the fourth model uh, is the one that uh, Ian Barber himself uh, was a proponent of, uh, it's integration. And this is the idea that uh, we should shoot for some kind of unity and consensus as we're incorporating insights from both science and religion. Um, there's a couple different ways that this has manifested recently. There's natural theology and a couple things along that line. Um, but the thing that uh, Barber himself was a proponent of is what is called process philosophy. Uh, so process philosophy, for those of you who aren't necessarily uh, familiar with the term, um, process, I'm just going to read, this is a, a definition out of uh, one of Barber's books. It's uh, rejects determinism, but it allows for alternative potentialities and accepts the presence of chance as well as the lawful relationships among events. It shares with evolutionary theory the conviction that processes of change are more fundamental and enduring than substances, and that no absolute line separates humans from non-human life, either historically or in the world today. In process thought, God is the source of order and also the source of novelty. God presents new possibilities into the world, but leaves alternatives open, eliciting the response of entities in the world. As source of novelty, God is present in the interiority of every event as it unfolds, but God never exclusively determines the outcomes. This is a God of persuasion rather than coercion. God is not an omnipotent ruler, but the leader and inspirer of an independent community of beings. So this is the idea that <clears throat> God gets things going, but he doesn't necessarily just say this is the way things are going to unfold. Uh, he leaves uh, choice up to us as humans and random chance also just being part of part of the evolutionary process um, that God is involved um, more in laying out the the realm of possibilities than necessarily saying this is the way things are going to be um, it's a very different idea and uh, it's just one way in which uh, Barber was a fan of um, being able to to allow all of 
all of uh, what we learn from the, the science of the natural world um, to allow that to be true, but to also uh, leave some room for God to, to be involved in the process. Um, and like I said, rather as a persuader rather than a, a coercer. Um, so that's something to think about, something to spend a little bit of time researching. Um, so that's the introduction for what we're going to be talking about this month. Uh, I'm going to list a couple extra resources. There's a very good website um, from Carlson College where Barbara used to talk that I'm going to leave a link for. Uh, there's also um, my favorite philosophy blog slash podcast, uh, The Partially Examined Life, has a series of blog posts um, about the science and religion specifically, and they start with going through each of these four um, categories that Barbara has, so I'm going to have some links to that as well. Uh, so what I want you guys to do now, um, do a little background research if you want to, uh, think about some of these things, but more importantly, I want you to take some time to think about your own beliefs um, so far as these things go and see uh, you know, if what you believe can kind of fit into one of these categories or maybe some of all four, maybe some of a couple of them. Um, just examine what your own beliefs are. And then I want you to think about um, how do your beliefs about these things uh, affect how you act in the world? Does uh, the way that you view how science and religion interact with each other affect how, uh, does it affect how you vote? Does it affect um, how you think about what's right and what's wrong? Does it affect how uh, the choices that you make in your life? Um, and after you've spent a little bit of time thinking about this, post, post, post in the group, uh, we want some discussion, uh, we want some back and forth. I want everybody to be polite about it. I want you to keep your ears open first, but do not also be afraid uh, to open your mouth and tell us what you're thinking. Uh, like we say, our little uh, slogan for the group here is open your ears, open your mouth, and open your mind. See you on the discussion group. Mm -hmm.